Hello everyone. Today's lecture is about transnational solidarities, diaspora and identity politics. It uh, uses some material from my own PhD research with Iranians in the UK and their modes of collective action, uh, social movement building, campaigning, different forms of solidarities that uh, happen among uh, Iranians and their non-Iranian allies. And that's why I'm interested in finding out when diasporas use identity politics as a mode of building solidarity within a certain place or transnationally, and when uh, they go beyond confines of identity boundaries. Uh, today's lecture is the first that we are doing uh, online due to the COVID-19 fear that uh, has kept us all at home. Uh, some journalists are now claiming that uh, what you see in the map in front of you, the crossing of borders that have mixed us uh, of, across all lines of difference, uh, ethnicity, religion, nationality, uh, across the world, this era of globalization that has led us to this uh, stage. Some are claiming that uh, has come to an end with this uh, pandemic. Let's wait and see. As academics, we tend to take a bit of longer time to be able to make such grand claims. But uh, it is an apt uh, mode of delivering the lecture. Uh, transnational solidarities a lot of times do depend on these virtual modes of communication to sustain themselves. And uh, maybe in this new stage of globalization that, that we are waiting to see, uh, these modes will have more relevance even it's now affecting our day-to-day -day lives within a locality of London. But getting into the lecture, first uh, I deal with the first generation of diaspora, the concept of diaspora, the definitions that uh, gave birth to this. Ho, in her 2015 paper, looks at the, the original definitions of diaspora as it refers to a population scattered abroad but which claims affinity with a purported national homeland and community. I've highlighted these two words, national homeland and community, because of a common sense of ancestry, ethnicity or identification. So identity here becomes important in relation to a homeland or a community. The word diaspora was first used in the Greek translation of the Bible to refer to the Jewish people who were exiled from their homeland and were scattered or spread around. So again, a homeland, an ethnicity, a religion are very important in defining what Greek diaspora are or were. In recent decades, diaspora has expanded into a conceptual paradigm that covers many other cases of ethnic, religious, or national groups who live away from their homelands. Uh, here, uh, these are from the book by Cohen, which was originally published in 97. It was a very important stage in diaspora studies. Uh, the first iteration of diaspora studies. But then later in 2008, the second generation, the second edition of the book, uh, by responding to some of the criticism of diaspora and also recounting what were the successes of diaspora as opposed to certain concepts like transnationalism. The concept of transnationalism uh, was originally uh, started in the politically sanitized and economic theories of globalization. But the concept of diaspora, according to Angela Jani, uh, has been hailed as a better platform for post-colonial mobilization against racism 
or white supremacy. So the concept of transnationalism did not have the political potential for mobilizing here based on race and post-colonialism because it was sensitive to those differences around ethnicity, around colonizer and colonized, or about white and um, non-white. On the other hand, the concept of diaspora has been criticized by social constructivists such as Bra, 1996, because of its de dependence on communities defined by a shared homeland or ethnic religious identities. Again, here Cohen is recounting some of this uh, criticism. Bra's uh, book was a very momentous uh, stage in this social constructivist. Social constructivists, uh, as you probably know, uh, believed that uh, whatever concept we have, like gender, ethnicity, uh, and so on, are socially constructed within language, uh, discourse. And uh, therefore, we are able to deconstruct them, we are able to challenge them, uh, and take away the structures of power that come along with these discourses that are usually defined by the powerful, knowledge and power, as Foucault was very influential in teaching us. So this dependence on uh, communities defined by a shared homeland or ethnic religious identities itself was problematic. We'll get into why these constructions were problematic. Second phase of diaspora politics resulting from these uh, criticisms have dissociated the relation between diaspora on the one hand and homeland, place and ethnic community on the other. So they try to not be bound by very specific essentialist uh, uh, relation to a specific homeland or ethnic religious identity. However, Diaspora uh, studies have been criticized by a third group of authors. This maybe gives uh, rise to a third stage of uh, dealing with this concept, including Antias and Soisal. They have decided to do away with the concept of diaspora altogether because they believed that it was irredeemably flawed. Again, Cohen uh, helpfully gathers this uh, criticism in the second edition of his book. According to Antias, the concept of diaspora could not produce a platform for trans-ethnic, gender-sensitive, anti-racist movement and instead triggered a new reconstructed form of ethnic absolutism. This is very important. We're getting close to the identity politics that came out of that uh, sort of definition of diaspora that uh, did not allow trans-ethnic or gender-sensitive anti-racist movements to come out of collective action. Soisal has a very specific project. Uh, the concept of diaspora, she finds it uh, not, uh, she found that it could not prov uh, provide a means of understanding post-national citizenship in Europe. In Europe, what was happening uh, with the boundaries between the countries uh, uh, becoming less important than the boundaries around Europe, the concept of diaspora could not explain the specific case that Soisal was looking at uh, because Europeans in other parts could not be explained by this concept. Some examples of the retrogressive potentials that of uh, diaspora, diasporic identification come from the very interesting paper by Sean Carter. Diasporic identifications among Croatians in the US 
led to forms of identity politics that reproduced relations of power based on race, ethnicity and nationality. Carter concludes that instead of celebrating the potential of the hybrid and diasporic to transcend essentialist notions of identity and subjectivity, we should pay attention to two aspects of diaspora experience, the geographical specificity of particular diasporas and the ways in which essentialist modes of being are often reproduced within diasporic discourse. So Carter says we cannot use this concept uh, universally, we should look at the geographical specificity in the particular case of the uh, Croatian diasporas in the US that he looks at, he finds that there are some essentialist modes of being reproduced within the diasporic discourse. So diaspora discourse is not always anti-colonial, it's not always progressive, but those uh, forms of identity politics, uh, for example, Carter finds that uh, these Croatians in the US some layers of them that were very active were collecting money to help those elements back in the former Yugoslavia, uh, seeking independence, but also having agendas that uh, involved genocidal uh, aspects that uh, came out of these essentialist modes of being, us versus them. Uh, that the diasporic discourse reproduced. Other examples of diaspora identity politics and talking about the concept of hybridity come in the work of Ang and Mitchell. Looking at the example of the Chinese diaspora, Ang also illustrates how subscribing to the closed definition of diaspora can lead to re reactionary forms of identity politics and therefore suggests moving towards the concept of hybridity, which makes it possible to live together in difference. So, in order not to be bound by these limited uh, definitions of identity and identity politics, uh, Ang suggests that we move towards the concept of hybridity. So, we don't limit it to uh, homeland, to ethnicity, we can talk about all of us living together in difference. Difference has a spectrum that does not stop or end with the boundaries, cultural or geographical boundaries of countries or ethnicities or homelands. All good here, but other authors have criticized this. They called it hype of hybridity or fetishizing the notions of diaspora and transnationalism as inherently liberatory and disruptive to hegemonic narratives of race, ethnicity, class, and nationality. Mitchell does this in her empirical work, and then Guarnizo and uh, Michael Peter Smith also come up with the other concepts. They have found instead that these deterritorialized and hybrid social groupings and the liminal spaces they produce can just as easily be appropriated for capital accumulation and reproduction of power relations. Mitchell also works on um, Chinese diaspora and uh, it's a very interesting paper that uh, Catherine Mitchell I suggest that you look at in the reading. Uh, Guarnizo and Smith have another suggestion. They try to situate the diaspora as antidotes to the placeless conceptions of diaspora, transnationalism and hybridity. Guarnizo and Smith propose transnationalism from below and translocality as situated concepts that are neither celebratory nor dystopian in terms of their political potentials. Smith also continues uh, writing about this, other than the joint work with Guarnizo. So they suggest um, a concept that they call translocality instead of transnationalism. So they are playing with this uh, 
concept of locality versus nationality. National uh, boundaries uh, may reproduce certain forms of essentialism. But then Ben Page also questions local as a more uh, progressive concept. Ben Page, 2011, questions if translocalism in the sense of non-geographic localism, for example, African hometown associations, might gloss over the reactionary politics based on the ideology of localism. So moving from national to local, according to Ben Page, doesn't solve the problem. He claims that fetishizing the local as opposed to the national only rescales the same problems and it could even undermine larger solidarities around axes other than locality. So if we want to make progressive uh, solidarities, solidarities that are not based on us versus them, are not based on essentialist forms of uh, identity, then locality just changes the scale of the problem to a smaller scale. It does not solve the problem of national homelands. I come to the examples from my own research, the case of Iranians. The focus on the concept of diaspora on ethnic, religious, cultural, or national identity, I found them too limiting or even orientalizing in the case of uh, these Iranians. Why? <clears throat> I find it, found it hard to find axes of identity around which a singular Iranian diaspora can be defined. Um, in my empirical studies, for example, I found that uh, many Iranians uh, did not even want to associate it with the country Iran, some calling themselves Persians, some not even uh, uh, trying to associate in any way possible if they come into a crowd that speaks Persian or if they hear that somewhere there is a party or event happening that there are too many Iranians there, they would avoid it. They take pride in not having that many Iranian friends when they live abroad. They just try to associate in many ways. Also, other axes of identity other than nationality or ethnicity is religion. That uh, there have been scholars that have called non-Islamiosity as the prime expression of identity among Iranian diaspora. If there is something, as you see, I use inverted commas, if there is something that we can even call Iranian diaspora, because without a association with the homeland, without um, having those uh, clear boundaries of identity, then maybe the concept of diaspora becomes less relevant. A focus on identity can also cause it to become trapped in an identitarian prism. This goes back to Foucault and Miller that imposes the closure of identity through an apparatus of colonial domination whereby the self is encoded in, by references summarily imposed from the outside. Um, you will find this paper by D'Andrea in your reading. Um, identitarian is modeled somehow after totalitarian. Identity itself when you uh, impose it onto people uh, can become like a prison that they cannot step out of. Like You are Iranian and you cannot be anything else. You're born there and that's who you are. You don't even give a chance to that person to become different even if they want to. It's a bit like imposing gender onto people based on their sex. Codes of identity like nationality and citizenship imposed onto migrant bodies by state bureaucracy or race, gender and class imposed by other members of society. These are some examples of these uh, references summarily imposed from the outside. Such codes of identity may also be strategically adopted by the trans migrants in their negotiations with external forces. So sometimes migrants themselves have to resort to certain identity forms the same way that uh, sometimes uh, gender politics need to uh, 
go for politics of visibility. They may uh, strategically decide to come up with certain identities that they choose. Sometimes Iranians have to, uh, like every other uh, diasporic group, let's say, in different situations, you have to perform your identity differently. So what are these examples uh, when trans migrants, transnational migrants in negotiation with external forces may strategically adopt certain codes of identity? In the example of my research, there were moments, for example, a campaign in support of the nuclear deal after the deal was made between the uh, five plus one United States and European countries and Iran uh, for Iran to stop uh, certain parts of nuclear activity of enrichment of uranium and for the West to lift sanctions, certain parts of nuclear sanctions. This deal, when it was supposed to be accepted or rejected by the American Congress, Iranians across uh, about 100 cities around the world came to show their support, whether or not they were supporting the Iranian government, uh, mostly weren't, at least in the groups that I uh, saw in London gathering in Trafalgar Square. However, a lot of them that did not associate with uh, Iran or Iranianness in their daily lives until then felt like uh, carrying flags. Uh, flags in Iranian among Iranian diaspora is a source of contention whether they want to carry the uh, flag of Islamic Republic, which has the word Allah written in the middle of it, or the royal flag that has the royal emblem or the historic uh, lion and uh, sun and sword on it, uh, or whether some that carry the three colors, red, white, and green, without any sign or the signs that they make themselves in the middle when you go to an Iranian a uh, football game as part of the World Cup or somewhere around the world. Uh, sometimes you see tensions about which flag to carry or not at all. Uh, but at this stage, uh, there were nationalistic songs uh, sang by people. However, <clears throat> the activity was very much an activity of solidarity building. The word Peace was repeated a lot. The logo that uh, you see here, we support Iran deal, was using the signs of peace. And uh, I looked at uh, the activities that happened on Facebook for organizing this event, not only the London chapter, but also uh, globally, specifically focusing on what happened in London, in Trafalgar Square, and also when people afterwards spontaneously walked to a restaurant and shared food together. At uh, stages of organization, when uh, tags were prepared, when people performed uh, in Trafalgar Square, an, an urban stage, when they went around and uh, tried to inform people in different events uh, voluntarily, to come and take part and show their support. Um, this was uh, a mode of politics that uh, was trying to attract passerby, passersby. Uh, it was trying to present itself as a mode of politics that is not a mode of us versus them. This is, we are all in this together and promoting peace 
through support of this accord and not only Iranian. There were many non-Iranian friends and family who attended this event and there were many uh, non-Iranians who were invited uh, into and engaged and the way that the people performed as you see in the previous photograph there were some who were wearing a scarf and some who weren't uh, among the Iranian women and uh, in general it was a very convivial form of politics I found that the, there was no uh, central hierarchy even though there was a group that uh, initiated this move but they were not leaders during the event and uh, the spontaneous uh, form of collective action that uh, came about yes there were some who organized for a fabric and some paint to be there but the result of the work was uh, an outcome of the spontaneity of the people and uh, the conviviality that came about the spontaneity of who decides to sing a song and then whether it caught on in the whole group or not at the height of the moment there were uh, in my estimation and also some media outlets that uh, covered the event uh, we reached something like 150 people there in Trafalgar Square. Another offspring of this action was joining a demonstration outside the number 10 Downing Street when Benjamin Netanyahu was coming to meet with David Camera. This was shortly after that demonstration and it was after the deal was accepted by the American Congress partly as a result of all these campaigning and uh, lobbying that happened not just by Iranians but also by many progressive groups in America and across the world and Benjamin Netanyahu who was one of the uh, staunch uh, opponents of this deal was now coming and uh, a contingency of the people in Trafalgar Square when it was advertised on the Facebook group uh, decided to go and attend this uh, and uh, show their anger at uh, Benjamin Netanyahu this poster designed because he had uh, given a lecture in the uh, United Nations Assembly uh, saying that Iran is basically a ticking bomb and uh, here the mode of politics turned into more of an antagonistic uh, mode there were jokes of course Iran deal done peace won but also the joke was at the expense of Benjamin Netanyahu also the organization of the demonstration there was much more antagonistic there were pro-Palestinian groups there were uh, campaign for nuclear disarmament and our group also blended into the ones the opponents of Netanyahu whereas there was another part in the demonstration that were supporters of Benjamin Netanyahu and at some points tensions uh, went a bit higher and these two camps had to be kept separate from one another by the police and some people were uh, more zealous and ended up being taken in custody by the police but not anyone from the group of Iranians here our group was much smaller and it was an offshoot it was interesting for me to see how these solidarities were built with other uh, modes of politics that were more antagonistic also this group got a mention from the campaign for nuclear disarmament uh, uh, that uh, claim their solidarity with us through the uh, tannin that uh, tannoy that uh, they were using 
Another campaign uh, was in response to a law passed by the American Congress that uh, was called HR 158. It was about uh, <clears throat> the visa waiver agreement between certain countries and United States. And this uh, law uh, announced that if people are born in Iran and four other countries later on increased to six other countries, uh, this was a precursor to the Muslim ban at the era of Trump. HR 158 was towards the end of the Obama administration. And uh, <clears throat> there was a demonstration happening outside the American Embassy in Grosvenor Square in London. These posters were designed by voluntary uh, people who were also an offspring group of the Trafalgar demonstration, partly and partly uh, other people <clears throat> who started it spontaneously on Facebook. Facebook played a strong role, as I told you, virtual modes are very important across uh, borders, but also locally, they are very important for organizing such events. Some photographs of uh, what happened outside the American Embassy. Again, certain markers of identity, tea in the Iranian style with the teapot and teacups that have a very traditional design of uh, a Qajar king, an old dynasty. This is one uh, traditional form. There were certain Iranian suites there, uh, Iran written on balloons, flags, all of these, and also photographs to show to passers-by uh, about the attractions of Iran and tea served to them, but also here the tray was a tray with an American flag. So again, trying to show that these two identities are not necessarily mutually exclusive and they can go in harmony with one another. And uh, the people in these photographs are also not all Iranian. The face painting was done by a French friend who attended this in solidarity. Uh, there were many other non-Iranians who were showing up in this uh, demonstration as well as the, both the previous ones. <clears throat> so what we have here is a move from static identities, from static conceptions of identity towards hybridity and the next stage that I want to talk about is towards relationality. If hybridity was claimed inefficient and hyped too much and not very helpful, uh, how does relationality help us? Relationality, especially in the way that Dorian Massey has formulated it. So the emphasis of the concept of diaspora on static representations of identity is problematic because it is unfit for explaining the dynamic, blurred, and hybrid identity constructions, for example, among transnational middling Iranians. As I explained to you, <clears throat> uh, the identity constructions, at least until the moment that the, they needed to perform certain uh, modes of identity in order to defend certain Iranians, for example, that uh, have been living their life as a British person and then suddenly were stopped on the border because they were deemed uh, unfit. Having a British passport, suddenly you feel that uh, your Iranianness is a reason for you to be targeted and discriminated. Therefore, who do you build solidarity with?
Iranians and also others who are ready to support your cause. But because of its reactionary potentials for identity politics, nationalist exceptionalism, or ethnic absolutism, uh, this is one other reason that uh, static representations of uh, identity is problematic because of the reactionary potentials for identity politics, nationalist exceptionalism, or ethnic absolutism. This is what we saw in the example of Croatian mobilizations in the United States in the work of Sean Carter and Chinese diasporas that we saw in the work of uh, Ang and Mitchell. On the other hand, the critiques of the post-colonial and post-structural concepts of hybridity and networks rightly show that these concepts can obfuscate the power imbalances and progressive potentials within these networks. Mitchell was one who criticized the hype of hybridity. Uh, ben Page shows that the networks, uh, the mention that I had in the previous slides were by Ben Page, uh, was the criticism of focusing on locality as inherently progressive, but also in another paper on African hometown associations, uh, Claire Mercer and Ben Page have criticized taking networks as inherently progressive. And uh, they say that the, these uh, concepts don't take into account the power imbalances. For example, in the African hometown associations, these transnational networks can have regressive potentials because, for example, those people in the home country sometimes enjoy a certain level of power over the ones that are visiting, or in some cases, vice versa. We have to look at them case by case in each case of diasporic interaction or network. So one solution for avoiding this pitfall is to conduct a relational analysis of power geometries in a way that is sensitive to asymmetries of power. Dorian Massey shows us how we can identify these networks, but also not see them as totally egalitarian networks, as totally horizontal, but we can relationally analyze what are the power geometries, who is exploiting who at any moment, and then when these networks are reconfigured, when locations change, when power relations change, how uh, the identities and entities change and also their relations change. These are, according to Dorian Massey, co-constitutive. The relations, the spaces, relational spaces, and the identities and entities that uh, engage with one another the identities also change constantly because of the changing configurations in these relational networks. In my study, I looked at uh, some family and personal relationships of one of my respondents, one of my participants, as I call them, because the, the project was in uh, many ways participatory. Uh, I looked at the social networks of Amin, the pseudonym that we have here, living in London, introducing certain concentric circles of social proximity, as I called it. But uh, this conception was his own, that he saw it as concentric circles of closeness. In the first circle of closest people, there were family members, sister, myself as a friend, because this uh, person was uh, one of my close friends. I didn't tell you that the uh, parts of my research was in my own network of friends and family, then in my own networks of activism, then in my own networks of collective action, like organizing a conference and so on and so forth, a colloquium. This was a part of uh, uh, those in my own network. So I am also in this first circle. There is cousin, number three, uncle, number three, mother, father, female friend, male friend, and so on. But also afterwards, 
we decided to divide them. This was a secondary thing, like this pizza cuts based on their geographical location. But that was not the most important thing in the way Amin saw his own extended self. And some people were moving in and out. So this is about how important these networks were in Amin's sense of self, in his entity, in his identity, as a result of these relational networks. On another level, I looked at some uh, a diagram of familiar relations, current locations, and citizenships and residence permits in a network Sorry, delete this. Much better. Uh, this was a familial network scattered between Tehran, Dubai, Sydney, Auckland, Paris. And my respondents, Sina, Sam, uh, Rana, were, and Reza, these were cousins and brothers that were scattered in different countries. The mother was in uh, Tehran. The husband and child of the sister were in Paris. The two cousins were in Paris with their mother and father. One brother, Ali, was in Auckland. Then one brother, Reza, was in Dubai. They had these uh, uh, connections that uh, the family, direct family connections, I showed with the full lines and then the dotted lines were friendships or cousin relations, just to have a second tier, less important relations. But more importantly, I was looking at how across these borders, based on which passports or which residence permits that each of these people carry, the mother, for example, only having an Iranian passport. The ones here have French passport and Iranian passport. Those who are dual national, the husband and child, only French passport. The one in Auckland has an Iranian passport and a New Zealand residence permit. The one in Dubai has Iranian passport and a Dubai residence permit. These, uh, I don't continue with the other family members, uh, the family of the, for example, British wife of this Iranian uh, uh, brother who lives in Dubai, and her parents, and then other sister and husband in Sydney. That uh, These networks were very important in allowing those who only had Iranian passport and had a harder time crossing borders to gain the possibility to travel. How? By invitation letters, by information sharing, by facilitating when they visit. And now, through time, this network has changed a bit and one brother and his wife have moved to Auckland next to the other brother and now uh, the combination of passports and residence permits have also changed. This is one way of analyzing power relations as well, not only how people can exploit one another, power relations doesn't always entail that, but also how they can share certain privileges with one another. Another way of diagramming for me was uh, <clears throat> to see the movements of uh, single individuals from their place of birth, in this case uh, from Tehran to the UK and back and forth through time. The thickness of the lines show uh, which places they hold a passport, Iranian in this case, in which places they hold a residence permit, and, uh, and also the dots show 
important people that they have identified as their social networks that shows that these networks have a correlation with the places that these people move back and forth in order to refresh their uh, connections, their social connections, but also these parts that become part of their territories, transnational territories, have something to do with the, where the important social networks. There are sometimes people uh, impo of importance, uh, there are significant others that are in other parts, but a lot of times you, I found that in 27 diagrams that I did, that the, the important people that they introduced to me their significant others were also in those places that they held some form of rights to stay or they spent some time uh, going and uh, back and forth to and spend uh, long periods. Here, a total of 11 years in the UK, total of 17 years in Tehran and four months in Paris. But one way of looking at the these transnational mobilities and these social networks across boundaries is through the concept of flexible citizenship that Iwa Ong has def defined. She believes that the contours of citizenship in, in advanced uh, capitalist countries are represented by the passport, the regulatory instrument of residence, travel and belonging. Uh, in one way we saw that part, the importance of passports, you cannot uh, ignore it in any case. Uh, but there is another one disengaged from any positive ideological links to the nation state, diasporic Chinese that Ong looks at in her studies place their faith in the family and personal relationships that uh, in Chinese is called Guangxi rather than in the government. So that's one reason that uh, I looked at these social networks in all of these because they were very important in the sense of self, in, um, in the relations that define who we are and what our possibilities are, what our solidarities are across boundaries beyond the notion that uh, our passports defined who and what entities we belong to. Uh, another example that I looked at in my PhD research was the example of a colloquium, a gathering in London, which again was organized on a Facebook group and I also uh, gathered uh, a number of uh, people, volunteers, after I presented uh, in the colloquium about my PhD. I gathered a number of volunteers and we had a number of participatory workshops. Uh, the colloquium itself, if I want to introduce it to you in a very quick nut nutshell, uh, is a voluntary gathering, there is no money involved, fortnightly in a London university where <clears throat> people share knowledge and explore possibilities for collective action. And it was interesting that uh, when we were trying to define a membership criteria in these participatory workshops, for the colloquium, it was very hard to define identity based on nationality because do we say it's only for Iranians? No. Uh, we have had uh, people from Afghanistan attending in sessions that uh, Persian was the language. So we said, uh, shall we define it based on education? People have to be tertiary educated? No. Do we define it based on age? No. So any sort of definition that we wanted to put uh, around the colloquium was repelled. Therefore, what uh, we did was we said, okay, we 
go on with the sessions in the language, Persian language. But in practice, many, many sessions also happened in English, where there was a topic of interest or there was an Iranian who wasn't feeling comfortable talking about their topic of expertise in Persian or a non-Iranian who was invited because of their expertise that was of interest. What does this show? This show shows a move from identity politics in many examples to strategic ambivalence, what I have called strategic ambivalence, uh, which I will define further down. Limitations of identity categories based on ethnicity, culture, nationality, or religion in defining a community uh, is part of the problem for example, a singular Iranian diaspora. Uh, so it's hard to define a community as you see here, it's within inverted commas as a diasporic group. Furthermore, building solidarities around these axes runs the risk of invoking identitarian politics, thereby reproducing exclusionary boundaries and colonized minds. Identitarianism is a prison and it creates us versus them boundaries and also colonized minds, as we saw in the work of Miller and Foucault. However, strategic ambivalence towards identity categories involves a combination of strategic essentialism when it's needed and strategic hybridity. That means to start from commonly held representations before moving to nuance and mobilizing them. Yes, the group that gathers for making a demonstration against certain form of discrimination, they have to start from an essentialist identity category, in this case Iranianness, because Iran has been targeted. It's also easier to start within your own group, your own networks. It's hard to know somebody that you have no idea about whether to let them in or not. In one of the other campaigns, there was this problem of whether to accept certain people whose bank accounts were closed into the group. What if we don't know about them? What if they actually do have some links to terrorism or radicalism or other things that made us uh, paranoid? We don't want to associate with them. So it makes it more practical to create uh, an embryo or a kernel for solidarity. But the politics that arise from the ambivalence can also utilize identity categories as a starting point for solidarity building, but should always try to open up the boundaries to avoid exclusivity and reproduction of us versus them dynamics. So then when you establish that, you try to invite others. When you feel like you gain the momentum, you have a solidarity and blurring the boundaries by inviting other people to come and support your cause or beyond that through what is called the politics of becoming minoritarian. Sometimes you actually have to take the cause of people uh, that are just next to you and are more discriminated than your group. This needs more explanation. But uh, we'll do that in the discussion, however way we can make that discussion happen. Uh, this is the last slide. Belonging as such cannot be perceived as one-dimensional, fixed and permanent feelings towards a space such as a homeland, city or country. This is what Antonish has said. Consequently, <clears throat> belonging is not necessarily defined by a fixed territorial entity. It can exist simultaneously in various scalar, territorial, 
or relational networked forms. So some scholars like Sally Marston have said that relationality and networked conceptions, flat ontology as she calls it, uh, trump uh, scalar or territorial definitions. No, sometimes in our strategic ambivalence we can have a territorial notion coexisting with a relational and networked and blurred form of solidarity. It can be multiple and hybrid, conflictual, contested, or at times might tend to be more homogeneous, centered and definable. But what is the role of states as a reference for defining such belongings? How do migrants develop such multiple belongings or unbelonging, estrangement, outsidedness, if such words exist? When they navigate various terrains, they cross borders. Value systems that exist in different places and socio-material networks, the networks some of which I showed you in the diagrams. What are the political implications of these modes of belonging? How can we build new solidarities around what goals and with which allies? So when you have multiple belongings, you have multiple uh, concerns at points you feel discriminated, at points you feel uh, a certain cause is close to your heart. Who are your people? Who are the ones that you build solidarities with? How do you define those goals? These are some questions for discussion. Um, we will see if we can uh, make it technically possible to have a group chat online. I still haven't explored the possibilities, but otherwise we can use the forum and um, you can get back with any comments that you have there until we see whether by Monday we can have a solution for all of us from home to also have a seminar like hour of uh, discussion. Have a good day. Uh, it's been one hour that I've been talking. I hope this mode uh, without seeing one another face to face does work. We have to experience new ways of uh, connecting with one another. At least this would be one fruit of the COVID for us. Have a good day.